than the, the sum of the individuals. You're still with us. I'm Deepa Palani and with my very dashing in Tangerine host, Ooh. Shafiq Shuwe. How are you doing? Very good. It's a very good, uh, very good morning to me. How's the um, aura? How's the vibe this morning? This beautiful Tuesday, windy morning. It, it's very calm. It's calm. So it's very cool in the morning. So yeah. you know, not too bad. Because not I'm too feeling bad. the Christmas vibes. The, the Euro European Christmas vibes. European. You know, very, very cooling in the morning, right? Right, right. I get that, you know. As long as there's no snow on top of the buildings. Uh, I, okay. wish, I wish there's snow in Malaysia, though. What? We have some in mind. ICT. And ICT. Yeah, okay. But uh, speaking <laughs> of snow and Europe, we're moving to our sports segment where we're talking about the London 2012 um, Olympic Games that, that's happening next year. Wow, but of course, wait. we are talking about our national athletes here in Malaysia. This article is from The Star. Mm -hmm. So, final Olympic chance for Cairo Nizam. So, uh, Cairo Nizam is our elite sailor. Mm -hmm. And he still has a chance to qualify for the 2012 Olympics, says uh, Malaysian Yacht Association General Manager Mohamed Effendi Abdullah yesterday. Well, he added that Malaysia were ranked 43rd out of 48 teams in the qualifying rounds in Perth, Australia recently. Only 36 uh, teams were selected in Perth and the other 12 would know their fate in the World Championships in Germany. Wow, this is quite an achievement for Malaysia, isn't it? That's right. Sailors, we never really hear much about them. That's why we're actually talking about this today because we're actually talking about badminton. We're so uh, concentrating on badminton and other sports that are making waves in our country. True. But about yachting, you know. So, uh, this not played much in our article. Okay. Okay, we're sorry. The article is actually from the New Straits Times. Wow, I love I love New Straits Times for reporting things that we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't normally read about. You know, thank thank God we have um, a very skillful uh, group of uh, sailing team right now. So I hope all the best. Well, for the next Olympics. You know what? We need to play as many sports as you can because we need to get our first gold medal at the Olympics. Yes. I mean, I know that the badminton, uh, Dato' Lee Chong Wei has been practicing and mm -hmm. he is aiming to get our first gold because he actually got our silver medal in our Beijing Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, squash is not a sport in the Olympics. If squash no. is a sport in the Olympic, Nicole David will get the gold medal. Again, again and again. And I'm so proud of Nicole David. But just to be safe, we need to play in as many sports as we can, including uh, yachting. Well, as Shafiq rambles about racket sports, we move on to another sport, but this one uses a bat. It's cricket. Okay. Um, this one from uh, Nepal. Um, SNTV takes a look at cricket in Kathmandu as Nepal bids to become a serious challenger to neighbouring India in that particular sporting arena. Let's take a look of what kind of challenge Nepal gives India. In Nepal's capital city, Kathmandu, cricket is king. Games are a daily occurrence all over Kathmandu's public parks, a far cry from 15 years ago when it was simply considered a sport for the elite. In 1996, satellite television first beamed live pictures of a cricket World Cup to the Himalayan nation and it was also the year that Nepal played its first full international cricket match, a combination that put the sport on the fast track to popularity in the country. The next logical step for Nepal is to try and qualify for the one-day World Cup together with neighbours and world champions India. However, the sports governing body, the ICC, have decided to reduce the number of teams that will take part in the 2015 tournament in a bid to shorten the competition, meaning that developing nations such as Nepal could face a difficult battle simply to qualify. In an attempt to boost the sports development, the Nepali cricket authorities have begun to direct more funds into grassroots cricket. There are now regular inter-school tournaments throughout 
throughout the year, giving the next generation of Nepali cricketers competitive games to play in. The investment seems to be working, with the country's under-19 side finished in 10th place in the World Cup in Malaysia. With a population of 30 million and a national team who are inspiring the country's next generation of cricketers, Nepal looked to have the potential to one day play the sport at the highest level. Less than 20 years ago, cricket in Nepal was a game few people ever played. Yet with players like Paras Katka working tirelessly to elevate the standard of the game in the country, maybe it won't be too long before Nepal are a major force in the sport. You know, I used to do that with a badminton racket, trying to balance the shuttlecock. You know, how many times can I can I do it without, yeah, I without dropping the, the shuttlecock well. to the floor? I mean, it was done during my physical education class, and it was just a practice. I didn't do oh, so well. Though. You made it sound so formal. Well, <laughs> let's look at something that's not formal at all: beach soccer. Well, moving on to beach soccer's growing popularity across the world uh, is even being felt in Iraq. Sports such as beach soccer mm -hmm. have benefited from the country's slowly improving security situation. Mm -hmm. Iraq even boasts of. Um, a former uh, Iraq even boasts a newly formed beach wow, soccer national, national league, league, which was established with the help of FIFA. So mm. let's take a look at the story. Years of violence and instability in Iraq resulted in sport taking a back seat. But as the country's security situation slowly improves, so does sporting participation. Beach soccer has been one of the main beneficiaries. Football is the nation's most popular sport and its less famous cousin is benefiting from the love from the round ball game. With support from FIFA, a national league was formed by the Iraqi Central Football Association in 2010. There are 30 teams across the country, 18 of them based in the capital Baghdad. Two of the teams, Baghdad Tarimia in the green shirts and Al Hudud, clashed on Christmas Day. One of the league's leading referees, Ahmed Abbas, outlined the sport's recent rise in Iraq. FIFA provided material support to help set up the National League. They also assisted in training coaches and referees, among them Mithal Ali, the only female referee in Iraq, who was a fourth official in Sunday's match. The national team participated in their first international competition at the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup Asian Qualifiers in Oman in February. Understandably, the results were modest, but as the young squad gains more experience, it's hoped that results will improve. Baghdad Tarimia went on to win Sunday's match 2-1. The league's top eight teams were qualified to play in the Premier League. You know, any sport that's played on the beach looks twice as fun as normal, normal, you know, uh, normal terrains, like on a, on a court, especially it's an indoor court. It looks you feel more the fun. pressure. Yeah, but with that, you know, we have the soccer on the beach, anything on the beach, even volleyball on the beach, it just so seems less competitive, even though it is still a competition. Well, it's good that, you know, we're talking about sports and the elevation of sports in a country like Iraq. Iraq. You it's, know, it's a relief. It has gone through a lot, sports. you know, yeah. through the, after the attack uh, from the US yes. and the fault of Saddam Hussein, but we're talking yeah. about Iraq and how these people are actually coming together mm -hmm. for the love of sports and we're talking about beach soccer here you know that's one thing that media fails to report sometimes don't you think we've, we've when we see iraq we always see the sadness but that's we don't right. see the lighter side of just iraq. like uh, the visuals that were played just now at the story like the people that were happy the iraqis were happy I playing know, they beach were soccer. cheering and clapping and and re really rehearsing to go to uh, a higher level that's and right. i'm sure the uh, the national team iraq's national team will definitely make it if they put their uh, utmost uh, uh, spirits and uh, competi competition and you know if, if they really work hard you can achieve and also they're actually think? entering the international competitions as well because just like what you mentioned the media reports you know on the war mm. and all that they refuse to I mean not they refuse but they don't seldom report yes. on perhaps something like sports yeah you know, they were talking about the political um, arena about mm -hmm. the sports and interestingly uh, what was mentioned in the story just now they participated in the first international competition yeah. at the FIFA Beach Soccer World Cup mm -hmm. in Oman uh, they will compete that in February so it's good that they actually competing, Iraqis are actually competing elsewhere. Yeah, you know, like you said, media reports the bad news, but bad news is news, you know, but the type after of the news break, that I reported. we have good news, good news and some very nice, you know, bad news that made into good news. Gossip always works on news, doesn't it? So we'll be right back with our favourite segment of all, our entertainment segments. We have a story on our favourite uh, royal family, wow. uh, the British royal family. We can't wait for that, don't go anywhere. That's right.